Welcome to Smithville Brethren. Good to have you here together this morning, uh, Sunday after Thanksgiving. A couple things I want to highlight from the bulletin. First off, uh, I know it doesn't feel like it today, but winter weather might be coming soon, as soon as Tuesday. And, you know, then Wednesday it could be 70 and sunny. I don't know. We're in Ohio. But weather cancellations, just a reminder, we have this thing up on the screen, WQKT and the church website are places you can go if we're going to cancel uh, church because of weather-related things, uh, just kind of a reminder. Also, uh, Dee Durbin has left the offering envelopes. Dee's our financial secretary. They're actually uh, on the counter back there. If you have had offering envelopes in the past, they're in boxes back there, and then they are in alphabetical order, and you can grab yours on your way out today. Not in the bulletin, Luna Marie Mung was born on Saturday, 7 pounds, 15 ounces to Gregory and Caitlin Mung, Mike and Linda Mung, and Greg and Linda Mung, so that would be Mike and Linda, and then it's Mike's mom and dad, Greg and Linda, all are, uh, come to the uh, earlier services, uh, so grandparents and great-grandparents, and they're excited about the new baby, uh, mom and baby are doing well. Then we need to also extend the sympathy of our church to Dee Durbin. Uh, Dee lost her brother Dennis this week. The service will be on Tuesday. Uh, Dennis died on Wednesday of last week, so uh, we want to be in prayer for, for her. Father, thank you for our opportunity to gather together, to serve you, to love you, to uh, be encouraging to one another. And we ask that you would just do your work, uh, particularly we're thinking about uh, Luna, the new baby born to the Mungs, and we ask for uh, just health and uh, as they uh, enter this new phase of life of parenthood, that you'd give them everything they need to be the best parents that they can be. And for Dee, that you'd watch over her in the midst of her experiencing loss, that we might uh, see just your hand touching her and holding her in these days. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> Who 
Jesus Messiah, name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sinners, the ransom from hell. Jesus Messiah, Lord of all. Jesus Messiah, Lord of all. The Lord of all. The Oh 
We ask you today to keep us, keep us in your hand so that no one can take you away from us. We ask for comfort for those struggling with COVID and for those who have lost due to the virus. We ask for forgiveness that you give us grace as you are always ready and willing to accept us. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We have some uh, different people in the sound booth and lighting today. Um, Cindy Klein tested positive for COVID, and so she and Rich and Amanda are all quarantined at home. So we have some, uh, we've got the replacement crew uh, operating today. Thank you for your help. Uh, Thanks for stepping in. Um, We're going to look at a psalm this morning, Psalm number 130. If you've got your Bible, you can flip to it. Uh, But Psalm number 130, one of the psalms, um, I think one of the things that's most endearing and enduring about the psalms is that they speak a language that is the language, I would say, of our hearts. The, the Psalms don't read like a theological book that, are, that is supposed to be uh, precise in every word it uses. It is not intended to be like a textbook where uh, it is dis, uh, communicating specific, specific information in a very, again, precise way. It doesn't read like a newspaper article that uh, hopefully is accurate and precise in certain ways. Uh, It doesn't read like those kinds of things. It is the language of the heart. And so it's written in poetry. It is meant to be sung. It is more uh, closely aligned to our hymns in the church or in music with lyrics uh, than, than it is with theology as a textbook. And yet it communicates Uh, some amazing things about who God is, who we are, how the world works, and so on. I I, draw your attention for a moment to Psalm 23. In Psalm 23, it says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with me. And it tells us in that, that God is with us in the most difficult parts of our lives and in the uh, darkest hours we experience. There is no valley of the shadow of death. It's a way of expressing in the hardest times of my life. Earlier in the psalm, same Psalm 23, it talks about being led beside quiet waters, being led to green pastures. Again, uh, pictures and images, not of specific places, but of places of rest, places of restoration, uh, the psalmist says, for my soul. So the Psalms are writing at that level. Uh, When we listen to modern music or even the hymns of the church or the worship songs that we sing, we might resonate with them. The words resonate with us when we say, that's me. I I recognize me and that. I think of a a hymn, uh, it goes like this, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. And it's expressing that, the, the waywardness in our hearts that we sometimes are confronted with. And the, the, the hymn writer captures that so beautifully in words I wouldn't have put together in that way because that's not how I'm wired, but uh, God has given us folks to do that. And in the Psalms, we see that kind of language of the heart. And so uh, I want to read for you Psalm 130. I'll read it from the New International Version. Uh, it says this, Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I put my hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than a watchman wait for the morning, more than watchmen wait for the morning. O Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel for all their sins. Uh, The psalmist is telling us a number of things. The first is he's expressing uh, the heart's cry. The heart's cry. That's the first thing I want us to see this morning. The psalmist begins with a cry to the Lord. It says, help us out, Lord. Help us out. I cry out of the depths. Now, is he actually crying from inside a cave? No. 
He's expressing what it's like to be overwhelmed, to be uh, penned in, to be uh, drowning in a flood. He's talking about desperation and the language of anguish and hopelessness that we feel sometimes, sometimes because of our circumstances, sometimes because of what's going on around us. Maybe some of you are feeling this way. I, I, I would have expected back when the pandemic began that we would be further along than we are, and I would have thought that we would have been done with masks and restrictions and all those kinds of things. But remember, I was hired at Smithville Brethren Church as pastor, not prophet. And so what I think about the future is not all that much, uh, not that valuable. Sometimes we feel like we're over our head. Uh, our relationships are cl- crumbling apart. We're, we have strain or stress between us and, say, a neighbor or a coworker or someone in the church or someone in our family. And, and then we feel a sense of being overwhelmed, like we're in this pit or we're in this uh, you know, a deep, dark pit or this drowning floodwaters or whatever. That's the psalmist is talking about those kinds of experiences. Out of the depths, I cried. And maybe the depth for us is really about a health concern we have. A lot of talk about COVID and uh, people we know, people, uh, an increasing number of people I know have been diagnosed with this. Uh, Some are really, really struggling uh, with their health, but there's lots of other health concerns. Cancer didn't stop. Kidney disease didn't stop. Heart disease didn't stop. Strokes didn't stop. All kinds of things are going on. And so maybe if we're in that, we feel the sense of being overwhelmed, like we're in a deep, dark pit. A number of years ago, maybe three, uh, a soccer team in Thailand, a y- of young kids, I think they were between 12 and 16, they went with their coach on a cave exploring experience. Now, I don't know about any of you, but um, here's how I would explore a cave. <laughs> Looks nice. I'm out of here. Because this body is not going in that hole. Oh, no, you can put a light on. No, 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 this body, not in that hole. Not happening. Splunking or whatever you want to call it ain't (laughs) happening. But anyway, they head down into this cave. And I believe it was after a soccer game or practice. They had their jerseys on. Um, They found a series of bicycles, the kids' bikes, all lined up along a fence Uh, near the cave entrance, and they had their bikes, their helmets, and their cleats all lined up. And the reason they found them is because a kid didn't show up for a birthday party, and the parents became concerned, and it launched kind of a, hey, do you know where so-and-so is? Wait a minute, where's the rest of the team? And And finally they realized the entire team, 12 kids and their coach, were missing. And they eventually found their way to this cave site where they found the bicycles, helmets, and cleats. So they knew they were there. Now what had happened is they had gone into the cave to explore the cave. I think they had been in caves before, if not this very cave before. So it wasn't an unusual experience for them, but they were in the cave and then it began to rain. And it was a torrential rain and the cave flooded. And so two miles in from where they started, they were trapped. They found themselves uh, able to get into sort of a, an air pocket, a part of the, t- of the cave that was above the water line, and they stayed there, and they ended up being in there for 17 days. Their f- getting lost, their getting trapped in the cave launched literally an international rescue mission. People from Great Britain, the United States, and other countries all ended up on the site to help get these folks out. They pumped the cave uh, water. They tried to pump it out. They they were trying to divert water by drilling another shaft and pumping in a different way. They did all manner of things to try to get to these kids. They eventually sent divers in, and the divers found their way to the cave. And if you want to look on YouTube, you can find this. You can see the uh, video footage of the first diver who comes up out of the water, and you're seeing from his perspective the kids are up on this rock, and they're, when they hear the voices and see the light, they start coming down the edge of the rock to get to the edge of the water to talk to these divers. And the divers basically ask, you know, how many of them, how many are you? And they said 13, which is the right number. That's who, how many were missing. So they were all together. They were all safe. Um, and then the diver basically says things to assure them, look, I'm the first There are many more coming after you. We're going to get you out. They brought a doctor in who then stayed with them for the remainder of the time they were in the cave. They ultimately sedated all of these kids because they had to dive out to get them back out, and they didn't want the kids to freak out, and none of them knew how to scuba dive. So they actually sedated them, put on oxygen masks, and 
one diver and one kid made their way out. When they got to the last kid and the last, um, probably the coach was the last out, they actually had to make a decision to leave equipment behind because the floodwaters were rising again and they were in a, uh, kind of an impending storm was coming. One person died in the whole incident. Now, can you imagine 17 days as a 12 year old in a cave? Like I don't have a flashlight that lasts 17 days. There's no light, there's no food, there's no drinkable water. You had to have felt like you were gonna lose complete hope. I mean, I don't know how you do that. And so the psalmist is describing a picture like that out of the depths, out of the darkness, out of the worst experience of my life, out of that, I cried to the Lord. And he's expressing this crying out to the Lord. And then he describes the heart need. Uh, we might think of our circumstances as the things that would make us feel like we're overwhelmed, like we lose a job, or again, a relationship in our life is not going as it should be. And these certainly are things that would cause us stress and cause us to feel overwhelmed. Uh, we might think of other things, financial problems we're having, or uh, we just really don't have um, much hope in our life. And yet the psalmist is really talking about something very specific. If we look at verse 2, we discover right off the bat that the psalmist has something in mind. He says, O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. And then in verse 3, if you, O Lord, kept a record of sins. The psalmist is not feeling overwhelmed by his circumstances He's feeling overwhelmed by his own inability to not live for God. He's feeling overwhelmed by his own sin. What he needs is mercy. What he needs is forgiveness. It's not that he needs someone to rescue him from a cave or rescue him from the pit. He doesn't, uh, it's not something he needs uh, rescued from a circumstance or a situation. He doesn't need a better job or whatever, whatever. What he needs is forgiveness. And there's only one person to cry out to, and it is the Lord. He basically says, God, if you held our sins against us, no one would be able to stand. No one would be able to live. No one would be able to live in your presence. And so he is overwhelmed by the reality of his own sinfulness. He's in despair over his inability to live as God desires him to live. And he's in touch with the internal sin we talked about a few weeks ago. He knows everything about himself and he realizes how sinful he is. Uh, it reminds me of Isaiah chapter 6 where it, it goes like this. In the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on the throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. In the Hebrew language, when you repeat the same word three times, it is our version of, uh, it would be like the most holy. It's, it's a, a way to express that. And so uh, Isaiah is experiencing this vision of being in the throne room of God, these creatures worshiping God, declaring his holiness, his perfection, his moral uh, purity. And in the light of that, he says of himself in verse five, woe to me, I cried, I am ruined. For I am a man of unclean lips, living among a people of unclean lips. My eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Folks, when we get a picture of the holiness of God, we cannot help but, uh, but think of the words of Isaiah. We are ruined. In light of his holiness and perfection, we are undone. And so, says Isaiah, are my countrymen. We will no longer make excuses or play around with our sin. We will run from it. And the psalmist, his cry is for mercy. He's not stuck in a cave needing rescued. He's stuck in a cave of his own making, his sin. The floodwaters of his sin are overwhelming him. He's drowning in it, and he cries to the Lord. But then the psalmist gives us a heart's hope. Verse 4 marks this transition. We go from despair to hope. We go from talking about his sin to talking about God's forgiveness, verse four, but with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared or revered. Uh, let's be clear about something. What the psalmist is hopeful in, what the psalmist is rest, resting his life on is not 
God's forgiveness, but God himself and the knowledge that God is a forgiving God. That may seem like a trivial distinction, but it's not. Our hope is not in anything but the Lord himself. Our hope is in who he is and how he has revealed himself in the scriptures. God is the one that we put our hope in. Have we, and we've said this before, but we can't save ourselves from our sin. The Bible is not a self-help book with formulas for better living. It is a love letter with, with instructions on how we ought to live. The psalmist's hope is in not the word of God, but in the writer, the author of the word of God, God himself. Uh, have you ever had a product that had a lifetime warranty? Uh, I have this experience sometimes. I have uh, some products that have lifetime warranty. So in, in some cases, um, like I'll break a tool and I'll go to the place where I can get it, uh, uh, they'll replace it because it has a lifetime warranty. And I just show up, I hand them a broken one, and they hand me a brand new one. And to me, that's like magic. I think, that, you know, it's like, whoa, this is awesome, right? I love that. But there are other warranties I've had that it seems like the warranty shouldn't be a lifetime warranty. It should be a warranty for as long as we want to warranty it. You know those kind of warranties? We used to call them at the, at the shop I worked at, uh, we offered a pavement warranty. This is an auto mechanic shop. So when your car tires hit the pavement, the warranty was over. You've had those kind of warranties, right? Um, I've had people say to me, no, 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 just bring it back to me. I'll fix it. And I think to myself, no, you'll make it worse, right? So the warranty is not the issue. It's who gives the warranty. It's not that we imagine God to be uh, forgiving is that it's that he is forgiving. He's a gracious and loving God. And so our hope is not in his forgiveness. Our hope is in him and who he is and how he has revealed himself in the scriptures as a merciful, kind, and holy God. So he's not a God of our construction in our mind. He's a God who has revealed himself in the scriptures and he's told us what he is like. The psalmist knows that he can rest his hope not in himself, not in his ability to get smarter or educate himself or be educated out of sin. It's not that he can earn his right to be cleansed. It's not that he can outweigh the bad with the good. It's that he trusts in the God of the scriptures. Later he writes, O Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love. Put your hope in the Lord. Because let me tell you one, one more thing about him. His love is unfailing his love is unfailing. That means, folks, that when you are obeying God and you are uh, spending time with him and worshiping him and orienting your life around his instructions and his directions in your life, when you're seeking to fulfill all the things he wants you to do, he loves you. And when you wander away from the Lord and you make choices that are uh, in opposition and you sin, the Lord loves you and desires you to return. Jesus gives us a picture of the love of God in the parable of the two sons. The one takes his inheritance, goes off, lives wildly, wastes his inheritance, and then it says, as he's coming home, the father, who apparently is watching for his son to return, sees him from a long way off and runs to him. He runs to him not to slap him or to hit him or to you know, dump a bunch of shame on him. How could you do this to me? How could you embarrass me? You've destroyed our family. He didn't say any of that stuff. Read it again, and you will see what he has to say is, even if the son, the son wants to apologize, no, 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 cuts him off, says, my son was dead, and now he's alive. We're going to have a party. Because God's love is unending, and our hope is in that God, that God who has revealed himself in scripture, who has revealed himself in Jesus Christ, in Jesus' words and his actions. But with you there is forgiveness because God is a merciful and loving God. So this is hope. This is true hope. Hope expressed here is the confidence of what we don't fully have yet. It says that God will redeem Israel from their sins, but from the psalmist's writing, he, isn't, he doesn't know about Jesus. He doesn't know the detailed plan that God has enacted in time. He doesn't know about the cross specifically. He might know in general, but he doesn't know specifically. He's looking forward to this. And he says, Israel, put your hope in God. The psalmist expresses despair at the beginning, but the language changes to a language of hope and hope in God. 
It says in the later part of the psalm that he waits like a watchman, like a, like a night watchman would wait for the sun to rise. Now, we don't quite get it, but you know, the idea is like, okay, we know the sun's going to rise if you're a watchman. Now, for us, we would wait and we keep looking at our watch or looking at our phone. Hey, what time is it? What time is it? We would have had a sunrise, sunset chart available to us somewhere or no, generally the sun rises about this time. Get all that stuff out of your mind and imagine someone in the ancient world waiting for the sun to rise in the dark. This season is full of expressions of hope, but some of it has to do with wishful thinking. Like my wishful thinking that we would be past where we are today in relationship to the pandemic. But there's other kinds of wishful thinking about this time of year, right? It's, it's Christmas, so there's wishes about Christmas gifts you might get. So somebody here today might say, I wish, I hope that I will get a transformer for Christmas. Anyone? I can't really see you. Yeah. Others might say, I, I wish or I hope that I will get a new doll. Someone else might say, I hope for a 75-inch 4K smart TV. QLED if we can manage. That's wishful thinking. Sometimes we call wishful thinking hope. The psalmist's hope is not that. It is an assurance of what will come based on the one who has given the assurance. The Advent season, today is the first Sunday of Advent, is both a season of waiting... We're waiting for the chance to celebrate Christmas. We're waiting for the period of time we've set aside to celebrate the birth of Christ that happened 2,000 years ago. But we are also filled with hope. Hope for the coming. Hope for the coming time where every wrong will be made right, where every injustice will be turned to a justice, where everyone who is guilty will be convicted and everyone who is innocent will be set free, where everything will be as it should be. And so we wait for Christmas and the celebration. But what we don't have to wait for is forgiveness. Forgiveness is available right now. The psalmist expresses this sense of overwhelm, being overwhelmed and hopeless at the beginning of the psalm, but he turns to the reality of forgiveness. His heart cry is for mercy. He's brokenhearted over his own sin, and he cries out to the Lord, and the Lord meets him with forgiveness. Again, you and I, we can't fix our sin, but God can. Our hope is not based on our ability to perform, to be good, to make it right, to make up for. Our hope rests in who God is. Christmas is the celebration of God's redemptive plan being enacted in the framework of time. His son came in humble circumstances, fraught with trouble and drama, Right? There's a move, there's angry king, there's wise men, there's a, uh, the gifts, there are the shepherds out in the field and the angels show up and begin to talk to them. There's the trip by the shepherds into the place where Mary and Joseph and Jesus are. And all of that points to the hope. We get to look backwards. We get to read Matthew and Luke. We get to think about what actually happened in time, but the psalmist looked forward with a steadfast hope, a certainty that God would do what God was going to do and redeem the nation of Israel. So today we might be watching and waiting, waiting for the Christmas season, but we don't have to wait for God to forgive us. He can do it right now. You might be listening today, and you might say to yourself, if you only knew what I've done, you wouldn't say these things. If you only knew the depth of my sin, you wouldn't say that God will forgive me. I really have to spend the rest of my days making up for the things that I have done, and I still don't think God will forgive me. But the reality is God already knows everything you've ever done, every reason you've ever done it, and he offers you 100% total forgiveness. The psalmist cries out for mercy and banks on the forgiveness of of a forgiving God. If you're hoping in yourself today, if you're hoping to reform yourself to be acceptable to God, I plead with you to stop trying. Stop trying and start receiving God's amazing grace and forgiveness. Does your soul cry out in the quiet moments? Do you long to experience full forgiveness? Then cry out to the Lord who both can be found and trusted. He is the one and only source of hope. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we can hope in you, that we can trust in who you are and how you've revealed yourself to us, 
that you are a loving, merciful, holy God who is willing to go to enormous lengths to secure for us an eternity with you. We thank you for Jesus, for this season of Advent where we watch and we wait to celebrate what we know has already happened in time and what we expect to happen when, Jesus, you return. And help us to have hearts full of hope because we have been redeemed. In Jesus' name, amen.